a few things as we begin this webinar, Birds of the Dan River Basin. Um, you have a question and answer box and a chat box. Um, you can use that at any time throughout today's webinar. Please um, make sure that you ask questions to all panelists and we will do our best to either try to answer them during the webinar or at the end. So stay on after the end. So with that being said, we are going to go ahead and get started. So I just want to, for those of you who don't know who the Dan River Basin Association is, we are founded in 2002. Our service area covers two states, North Carolina and Virginia. Everywhere the Dan River flows, which is about 16 counties, eight in each of those states. We help and protect and preserve the Dan, Smith, Mayo, Bannister, Heiko, and Sandy Rivers. And we do that through our memberships, donors, and volunteers. We have three main pillars of our mission. One is recreation. We offer first Saturday outings. We have a great one coming up, a paddle in July on the Beaver Creek Reservoir. We, we build parks, trails, and river accesses. We help municipalities with master planning. We have an interactive map on our website, which shows all the outdoor recreational assets throughout our service area. And we hold special outings throughout the year. We also focus on education. We have a famous award-winning trout in the classroom program, our streamside trees in the classroom program. We reach about 10,000 students a year with our K through 12 programming. We help schools become green. We hold public workshops and webinars like this one today. We hold rain barrel workshops and we just started recently in the last couple of months a Darbit at Home program. And you can find that on our website. Lots of really cool things for people and their families to do at home. And finally, our, our third pillar is stewardship. We offer water quality training and um, monitoring of as many streams and rivers as we can find volunteers to monitor. We offer a water protector certification program. We look at riparian buffers, storm drain marking, and we do dozens of cleanups throughout the year. Um, again, all of these things you can find on the DARBA website, danriver.org. And with that, we're going to get started, and I'm going to introduce Ken Harden. Hi, Ken. Wave to us. Hello. Hello. Um, Ken grew up in Mississippi. He attended, um, he worked at the School of Medicine at UNC Chapel Hill for 35 plus years. He retired in 2015, and he has been an avid bird watcher, what, since you were a child. Is that right, Ken? Correct. Um, he is now retired at his property in Stokes County. Um, he's been there for what, 11 or so years, nine or so years. And with that, Ken, I am going to hand it over to you and welcome. Thank you for joining us. And again, if you have any questions, please use your Q and A box or your chat box. Well, thanks so much, Tiffany. And thanks to you all for joining in today. I think Tiffany was prescient with her scheduling of this presentation today, given that most of us would not be outside seeing birds during our monsoon season anyway. So uh, we'll, we'll look at a few over the next uh, 35 to 40 minutes that we might see in our, our area. I, I certainly won't talk about all of them, but I'll show a lot of images of many birds we can see. Uh, one truth in advertising, uh, I, uh, as Tiffany said, I've been a birder most of my life, but I have no formal training in ornithology, no, for, no formal education. So uh, at the, in the question and answer, you may find that my knowledge of birds is uh, neither broad nor deep, but I'll, I'll do my best with questions. So uh, if we could go to the next slide, uh, uh, Tiffany, what's in the next and on? Uh, so we move to the next. Yeah, so what's the state bird of North Carolina? It's the uh, beautiful red northern cardinal. What's the state bird of Virginia? It's the same bird shown here in her lovely uh, female plumage. So if we saw a, a red bird outside in our area in January, uh, what 
you think it might be. Well, unless something really weird is going on, it would be a, a cardinal. Uh, in contrast, if we see a red bird uh, in June, what would it be? Well, if you saw it down low uh, near the ground, it would probably be a cardinal. But if there was a red bird singing from the top of a tulip poplar or a oak tree, it could well be this lovely bird, scarlet tanager, or, it's, or another tanager from the same family, another bird from the same family of tanagers, the summer tanager. And both, both of these birds come to our area in the summer to nest, but they don't exist here in the winter. So the point I'm making here is that it's nice to, to have some idea of what birds to expect when we go out in the fields, uh, out in the uh, area. And so uh, the next slide, uh, well, uh, how many bird species exist? If, we, if we're talking worldwide, it's now, I think the official counts up pushing 10,000. Uh, about a thousand of those are uh, observed in North America. Uh, in North Carolina, the Carolina Bird Club is sort of the uh, official voice for bird identification in, in, in North Carolina. 469 species have been identified and the authoritative voice in Virginia is the Virginia Society of Ornithology and about the same number of species have been identified in Virginia. But you have to, to, to remember this would include birds across the state. So if uh, it would include birds that we would see out at Cape Hatteras, for example, or out over the ocean. So how many would we expect around here? Uh, the Carolina Bird Club has confirmed uh, 309 species all time uh, in, in the area around Greensboro, North Carolina, Guilford County. Uh, we've been on our property in Stokes, or, uh, or at least owned our property in Stokes County uh, for about uh, 15 years now. And over that time, we've seen 150 species, different species of birds on our property. And on any given year, uh, we, we track down maybe 120 bird species, give or, give or, give or take uh, 10 or so uh, each year. Of those 120 species, about 50 of those birds are found here year round. Now, the, the, the birds that are found year round might vary slightly between the western air part of our region and the eastern part of our region, but it's pretty much the same across the region. And I won't go through the list. Uh, and some of these birds are more prevalent in the winter than the summer, and, and some are more prevalent in the summer than the winter. But you could potentially see about 50 birds uh, uh, during you know, any month of the year in our area. So uh, I said, uh, and so some of these year-round birds are ones we're all familiar with, Carolina wren, Carolina chickadee, tufted titmouse, the house finch shown, uh, male and female house finch, male and female eastern bluebird there, and then uh, the eastern towhee that uh, doesn't come so much to bird feeders, but often we'll see these birds scratching the ground underneath uh, bird feeders. And the next slide uh, shows, well, the American goldfinch, which if you put up bird, a bird feeder, you'll see a lot of these, particularly in the winter months, where they look like, the male looks like the bird on the left, and then it transitions in late winter into that gorgeous uh, breeding plumage of the male. And then that's a, not a very good photo of the lovely female uh, goldfinch there. Uh, and then there's, there's some uh, year-round sparrows, chipping sparrow, song sparrow, which is much more prevalent, at least in Stokes County in the winter than in the summer, uh, and the field sparrow. And then there's this invasive sparrow, if you will. Uh, the next one, if you click down to the house sparrow, and this, this is a bird that came over from Europe, I guess in the 1700s. And we've seen on one day, we saw one house sparrow on our property in 14 years. However, if I drive up to Stewart, Virginia, uh, into the town, or if I drive into Pilot Mountain, uh, into the town, uh, I see many, many uh, house sparrows. So they love, uh, they love buildings, but they don't love the wilds that uh, like we live in out at our property. 
So uh, next slide, please. Uh, other birds that are here year round is this flycatcher, the Eastern Phoebe that uh, perches uh, off and out in the open and wags its tail. Uh, the lovely Eastern Meadowlark that's here year round. Uh, the Cedar Waxwing uh, is a bird that uh, tends to move in flocks. It, uh, it has a very high pitched call. Uh, we had about 50 or 60 uh, that hung around a birch tree in our yard for about a about the entirety of, of May for reasons I can't quite figure out. But these birds fly as a very tight flock, you know, gorgeous, gorgeous bird. Uh, the Northern Mockingbird, I think we're all familiar with, and then a, another member of that family, the Brown Thrasher, which uh, we tend to see more in the summer, but we can see them in the winter here also. And the next slide uh, shows uh, year-round woodpeckers. The big woody woodpecker, woodpecker is a pileated, or maybe better pronounced, a pileated woodpecker. A northern flicker, red-bellied woodpeckers are common birds here. The downy woodpecker uh, is one of the more common birds we'll see, and I, we tend to see a lot of these in the winter. We see less of the hairy woodpecker, which looks a lot like a downy woodpecker, only it's just a much bigger bird. And then a redheaded, the red-headed woodpecker is found throughout our region also, but it tends to be very lo localized. So we've rarely seen one on our property, but if you go to a wetland that has uh, many dead trees with open cavities, you, you may find a, a, a nice population of red-headed woodpeckers. And then uh, uh, the, the duck that we tend to see that's uh, uh, one of the more beautiful ducks, I think, is the wood duck. Uh, uh, particularly in the fall paddling down the Dan River. I've encountered, encountered flocks of 30 to 40 of these uh, uh, that gather together after a nesting season. So uh, I said that there are 50 bird species that are here uh, year round, but then we observe 150 bird species on our property each year. So, how, so what explains that? Well, of course, what explains that is migration. Uh, a lot of birds winter and uh, far to the south of us and then migrate here to nest or migrate through here on their way to their uh, nesting grounds uh, to the north. A good example is American red star that nests, uh, sorry, that winters in the blue down in Central America, extreme northern South America or the islands of the Caribbean and then beginning sort of mid-April, early to mid-April, it starts migrating across the, the Gulf uh, and passes through the extreme southern part of the, the U.S., but then uh, goes to its nesting grounds uh, that can be mostly in the eastern part of our country then in, in, on up into Canada. And we're right at the edge of the nesting area of the Red Star. I don't think we've ever had a pair nest on our property, but I know they nest over on the Dan River, so I, I see them quite often over there. So, uh, and then uh, the next the, the next bird is this lovely uh, bird, the wood thrush, that sings its beautiful song from deep uh, deep woods. It winters in Central America and then passes uh, in late April to its nesting grounds throughout eastern uh, eastern U.S. And then uh, an example of a bird that passes through in the spring is the black pole warbler. And this is, uh, many uh, warbler species sort of have similar patterns where they, and the, you don't see the blue of this bird because it's actually wintering down in Brazil and beginning uh, sort of first, right, right at the start of late April, early May, it starts migrating north. And we tend to have quite a few black pole warblers on our property sort of from May 1st to the 15th or May 5th to the 15th. But they're on their way to their nesting grounds in, in Northern uh, Canada and Alaska all the way to the Arctic Circle. And then of course in September, they reverse the, the trip back to Brazil. So I have, uh, our property is in uh, Stokes County, a, a couple of miles. Uh, from the Dan River and pretty much due north of Hanging Rock State Park and south of Stewart, Virginia. And uh, I don't want to uh, uh, obsess over this too much, but I, I've, I've kept a, uh, 
a spreadsheet of the date of arrival of birds on our property uh, over the last 14 years, and of course, probably more accurately over the last uh, four to five years since I've retired. And so I want to show a couple of slides of birds that migrate to here and, and their arrival day. So one of the first uh, birds to arrive is a lovely tree swallow, which begins to appear sort of mid to late March. Uh, we tend to have three or four pair of these that nest in bluebird boxes on our property. And uh, uh, about the same time period, the lovely blue-headed vireo uh, begins to appear here and mostly passes through to higher elevation. Uh, but we did have a pair nesting on our property uh, this, this season. Uh, a very common bird uh, across the area is the common yellowthroat that winters in extreme southern uh, U uh, United States and uh, in the Caribbean, but migrates to our area. And look at the dates of arrival on our property of the common yellowthroat, April 5th, 5th, 3rd, 6th, 7th, 7th. So amazing that these birds Whatever the queue is that sends them north, they arrive at about the same date uh, each year in our area. Uh, the bird next to that is a, a blue-gray gnat catcher with a very vocal uh, 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 a bird that looks like a miniature uh, uh, mockingbird. The Louisiana water thrush is a bird that loves riparian. Uh, habitat. So there are a lot of these that nest along the Dan River each year. We always have a nesting pair along the small creek on our property. Uh, same goes for a parallel warbler in terms of along the Dan River, uh, a paddle down the Dan River in our area uh, in uh, late spring. You can hear these birds singing all the way down the river and they arrive sort of the first to second week in April. Oven bird, uh, a gorgeous uh, warbler species bird. It's called an oven bird because it makes a nest on the ground that's sort of shaped like an oven. And uh, this bird sings a very resounding so song from deep, deep woods. And it tends to arrive um, maybe the second week uh, in April. And then the next slide uh, shows some birds that arrive just a little bit later. We always have uh, several pair of prairie warblers nesting on our property. They love second, second cut growth of, uh, of uh, small uh, uh, deciduous trees and pines. And they arrive about April the 15th each year. The hooded warbler arrives at about the same time. It's a more of a deep forest uh, bird that stays, you know, sort of zero from the ground up to about 10 to 15 feet off the ground. Uh, indigo bunting is a bird that we see out in the open areas. Uh, there's the male and female, uh, a photo of the male and female shown there. Uh, and these uh, tend to arrive uh, maybe the third week in April. And two uh, species of vireo are shown on the bottom left. The white-eyed vireo, which tends to uh, uh, love habitats that are uh, at the uh, sort of brambles at the edge of woodlands. Uh, and, it, and another family member, the yellow-throated vireo, which sings from the very top of, of trees, deciduous trees usually. Uh, and these, uh, the white eye tends to arrive mid-April and the yellow-throated vireo just a little bit later. And again, all of these, prop, all of these birds nested on our property uh, this year and every year, frankly. Uh, and the next slide keeps this going, uh, red-eyed vireo, uh, house wren, if you put up a, 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 some, house, some bird boxes on your property, you're, you're likely to get some house wrens uh, occupying them. We've had a couple of pair around our house uh, singing their babbling song all, all day. Uh, scarlet tanager, the bird I mentioned earlier that sings from the top of trees, the wood thrush that I mentioned earlier. And then another fly catcher, uh, the eastern wood peewee that sings from uh, uh, deep, uh, Woods and look at the, the rival dates of the eastern wood pee wood peewee on our property. I can pretty much count on hearing one on about May the first every year, and then it'll sing all through uh, all through uh, nesting season till you know sort of August, and then it it, it moves uh, back south. And one of my favorite birds uh, is on the left, the yellow-billed cuckoo. 
arrived sort of early to mid May. It's that bird that I'll try to do its call. It goes call uh, from deciduous trees. It's sort of a skulker. It's sort of hard to see, but once you see one, it's wonderful to watch their behavior because they love to catch very big caterpillars uh, uh, from the limbs and uh, just a gorgeous, gorgeous true, uh, bird that's probably slightly bigger than a mockingbird. They're big birds. Um, next slide shows some other species that we can count on nesting in our area in the summer. Eastern kingbird that sings from uh, fence posts and fences. It's a flycatcher, so you'll see it catching a lot of bugs out of the air. The catbird is a member of the same family as the mockingbird and brown thrasher. It tends to, to nest in very deep bramble and can sound like a cat, one of its calls. A great fly, uh, flycatcher to see is the great crested flycatcher, very big bird. They have a squawky call and uh, they're common across, or fairly common uh, across our area. Uh, Orchard Oriole, and I don't think these photos do justice to the beauty of that bird, uh, the male on the left and the, the greenish yellow uh, female on the right. Uh, we have a pair of those nests uh, near our house every year, and the male starts singing at daybreak and sings till, well, pretty much all day, but certainly quite uh, vociferously to 10 o'clock in the morning or so every day. And then another blue uh, bird, the blue grosbeak, uh, that's common throughout our area. It's called a gross, not called a grosbeak for uh, no reason, if you see the size of that beak. In fact, uh, uh, Tiffany, if you wouldn't mind back, going back two slides and just compare the blue grosbeak uh, to the indigo bunting, which is a smaller bird and, a, and it's, color is much more iridescent turquoise and then, then back to the back to the uh, uh, blue grosbeak which is uh, a much bigger bird more solid uh, both of these birds uh, love open open areas and then uh, ah one of my favorite uh, bird another of my favorite birds is the whippoorwill although I have to say I uh, I've uh, considered uh, murder of a whippoorwill that's been singing all night just outside our bedroom window for about the last six weeks. Uh, it uh, uh, can be annoying because they will sing constantly. I, I find myself trying to catch my breath or catch the, uh, the breath for the bird. But anyway, these are birds that are, are nocturnal. Uh, the, uh, they arrive, uh, they, they, feed in, they feed at night. Uh, they arrive around the first week of April. Uh, the next, uh, if you'll pass on to that painting of uh, John James Audubon, uh, uh, shows a, a, a whippoorwill catching a moth. One of the main things they, they, they feed on are, are moths. And if we go to the next slide, uh, Ah, and so one of the most exciting times uh, for me for bird watching is during migration uh, in the spring, both the arrival of birds that nest here, but also there's another 20, 25 birds, uh, mostly of the warbler species uh, that migrate through our area in the spring on their way to nesting uh, uh, area, their nesting grounds, at higher elevations in the mountains or in Northern US or in all, quite often as with the black hole warbler I mentioned earlier in Canada. And so these are, are, are the warbler species tend to be very uh, varied in their color. They're all uh, quite beautiful. Uh, Black-throated blue and black-throated green warblers can be pretty common uh, during migration. We see, uh, you know, 10, 12, 15 of these uh, each spring, maybe more. Uh, we've talked about the black hole warbler and the American red start uh, uh, earlier. The, uh, the female me American red start is shown on the right. Uh, I haven't talked about bird behavior so much in identification of birds, but the red start has a very characteristic feeding pattern. It, it almost looks like a butterfly flying around the canopy, uh, grabbing insects and caterpillars. Uh, uh, very distinct in its movement. And black and white warblers that uh, migrate to our area. Some that's actually the 
they nest uh, in our in sort of the upper part of of, of the area of our uh, near the mount uh, uh, the upslope of the mountains uh, uh, the black and white warbler nest, um, but more commonly further to the north of us. And then the next slide shows uh, some more warblers that migrate through here in the spring. If I, I'll start by mentioning the Cape May warbler on the extreme left, the Blackburnian warbler, and the Bay-breasted warbler. All three, all three of these warblers love to sing from the tops of trees. So there's something called warbler neck that birders get because they have their binoculars looking up the top of the trees, trying to figure out what that is singing up at the top. And really, that's the way you can identify these birds, is hear them singing first in the top of a tree uh, and then get the binoculars out to find them up there. Uh, it's not that they don't come to lower elevations, but they tend to reside mostly in the, in the middle to the upper canopy of, of pretty big trees. Uh, Chestnut-sided warbler is a lovely bird that tends to be a little more in the, the mid to lower canopy uh, of of trees uh, in my, uh, during migration. Uh, the magnolia warbler uh, was named as uh, uh, one of many birds that are misnamed, if you will. It was named uh, because it was first discovered uh, in the late 1700s, if I remember, in a magnolia tree uh, on the, the coast uh, of Mississippi. Uh, and so thus it was called a magnolia warbler uh, by the person who saw it, not knowing uh, that it was actually, it had just migrated from uh, South America and it was, and, it's on, and was on its way to Canada to nest in uh, spruce and pine trees. And so it's, a, it's, a, a, you, uh, it's definitely a, a misnamed bird, but it's a gorgeous bird that, that uh, can be seen in our area uh, sort of the first week in May. Uh, we had three or four uh, Canada warblers on our property this spring. Uh, they can be seen a, a bit easier because they stay near the ground, uh, but they tend to sing from very deep uh, brambles. So it's often hard, you can hear them singing, but sometimes it's hard to see the, find the bird that's doing the singing. And the next slide, ah, oh, this bird is so beautiful. I thought it just needed its own, own slide. Uh, the yellow warbler, Tends to nest at higher elevations. Uh, I often see these up on the New River in North Carolina or hear them singing on the New River in North Carolina or uh, uh, Virginia. The next slide shows uh, a big bird that uh, migrates through our area to higher elevations in the spring. The rose-breasted grosbeak, they have a wonderful song that's not so different from a robin's song sing from the top of trees, but they also come to bird feeders to feed on, uh, on uh, sunflower seeds. So we're, we try to remember to put out sunflower seeds in our feeders uh, in April, because often we'll see a, a female or a male or multiple of these uh, at the feeder if there's some uh, sunflower seeds there. Uh, and and the, the hawks of our areas, uh, uh, hawks, hawks seen across our areas include the red-shouldered hawk uh, that uh, if you see a hawk in the deep woods, it's almost certainly going to be a red-shouldered hawk. A hawk of open areas is a, red, is a, a slightly bigger hawk called the red-tailed hawk, and it's named for obvious reasons, at least if you're seeing, looking at an adult with that distinctive red tail. And then there's a third uh, of this group of hawks called, I didn't mention it, but called Budios. Uh, there's a third big hawk called a broad wing hawk. They tend to nest at higher elevations, although they do nest uh, pretty much across our area, at least the northern part of our area. Uh, I tend to see them more in September when they migrate by the tens of thousands, I guess by the hundreds of thousands, down from Canada all the way to Central America. To winter, and so you can see them in, in large uh, groups uh, coming south on certain days uh, in September. But uh, I, I've seen a few over our property recently, like in the last month. So they they do they are around here. Uh, the uh, occipiters are, are two: the sharp shin hawk and the Cooper's hawk. Uh, these are two hawks that 
uh, that feed on other birds. So they'll catch other birds on the, in, uh, out of the air. Uh, they're very similar birds. They're sometime, they're very hard to identify. The Cooper's hawk tends to be a little bit bigger than the sharp shinned hawk. And if you notice the, the tail of the Cooper's hawk is rounded, whereas the Sharpie is, uh, has sort of a squared tail. But often I'll see one of these and say, well, it was a Sharpie or a Cooper's hawk, but lovely, lovely birds that tend to be here uh, year round although uh, I tend to see them more during migration and, uh, and actually in the winter around our property. Uh, next slide uh, shows some hawks that appear here only in the winter. On the left, the northern harrier at the bottom is a female or an immature male. Uh, the, mature, uh, the mature male is this wonderful regal silver creature, gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous birds. They're very distinct in their feeding pattern. They have an undulating flight that they'll do uh, maybe 10 feet off the ground over grasslands. So if you see a hawk flying low in sort of a slow undulating manner, particularly uh, over grassland in the winter, it's a good, good chance it's gonna be a Northern Harrier. Another uh, uh, Species that appears uh, in the winter is the American kestrel. We'll often see these on power lines. The lovely facial pattern on these birds, and they have a very distinct, uh, they wag their tail in a very distinct way as they perch on a, on a power line. And then we have, oh, and then in the summer, we have osprey uh, that appear uh, around our, our uh, reservoirs and along the Dan River. I often see. Uh, uh, this species, that photo on the right, was not at the Dan River because it's, a, I think, an ocean fish it's caught, but nonetheless, gorgeous, gorgeous bird. And we have to talk about the next bird, too, of course, uh, the bald eagle, which uh, also can be seen in our area around big bodies of water. And I don't know if you can point, Tiffany, at that thing with the white head there. But that, was, that is a bald eagle that I photographed on the Dan River a few years back. And this is, uh, this was, as you can tell, this is in the late, in the early fall, maybe late October. It was, and this happened uh, just below the uh, 70, Highway 704 bridge. The, I think that's the heart access. Uh, so several times I've seen bald eagles uh, and, several times mature bald eagles uh, while, while I was paddling in the Dan River. I don't know that they nest on the river, but they must be nesting somewhere nearby. We have some resident owls, the, the one that sort of does like <laughs> call, that's a terrible imitation, but you get the idea, is a barred owl, and then the big owl that does the who, who, who call is a great horned owl. And then there's sort of a, a, a screechy another world call that's given by the little screech owl. And all three of these are common across our area. In fact, we've had a screech owl that has, I'm not sure it's the, if it's the same uh, bird, uh, but last winter it spent a good part of the winter roosting in a duck, in a wood duck house on a small pond on our property. And then, I, and then we've seen, it or a screech owl roosting there uh, this spring on several occasions. So they're pretty common around. I don't tend to hear them so much until later, sort of mid to late summer, and then you can hear them calling quite often, at least around our property. But all three of these owls can be seen. And then there are some wading birds that are fun to see. Uh, pretty much any time I paddle down the Dan uh, in the summer, I'll see a little green heron, a spotted sandpiper, and a great blue heron. And I just put this bird on the right, the American bittern in, in here just for fun because this is sort of a pretty rare bird to see in the area. They tend to nest up in the north, extreme northeast in Canada. Uh, but uh, twice uh, in the spring, we've had a bittern on our property and they tend to stay, both times the bird stayed for a week or two uh, before it went on to its nesting ground up in Maine or, or somewhere. Gorgeous, gorgeous bird. So the birds migrate to the north in the spring, but then in the fall after they've nested and fledged their young, they 
they migrate south. Uh, and uh, birding can be exciting in the fall, but it can also be a pain because first year birds don't have the markings of the adult birds. And so uh, it's very hard to distinguish some of those gorgeous warblers from each other. These are all multiple species on this, uh, this, this page here, but uh, you know, you got to work real hard to figure out what's what, and I won't go there with any of those, but it's fun to, to try to figure that out in the fall as these birds go south. And then there are birds that migrate uh, south to our area for the winter. Not as many as come north in the summer, but there's a dozen to 15 I list there. The northern junco just flies down the mountain a bit to our area. A lovely little winter wren, real feisty thing. A common bird in our area in the winter is a ruby crown kinglet. You seldom see that ruby crown. Uh, the bird sort of next to it is also a ruby crown, sort of the image you tend to see. And golden crown kinglets are, are very common in the summer too. And whereas the wood thrush that nests here in the summer goes back to Costa Rica, the hermit thrush that nested up north in the summer comes and spends its winters in our area. And we can usually see three or four hermit thrush uh, around our property across the winter. Uh, and we see multiple yellow-bellied sapsuckers which come south in the winter. Uh, the next slide shows, I think, yeah, some more winter species, yellow rump warbler, white-throated sparrow, which becomes like the most common sparrow in the winter. They're, they're far to the north of us now, but in the wintertime, uh, if I saw a sparrow, chances are it's going to be either a white-throated or a song sparrow. Occasionally, we'll see this little brown creeper that crawl, climbs up trees uh, looking for insects in the winter. And then, fairly, uh, then sort of rarely, uh, we see red-breasted nuthatches in the winter. And I included photos of two other nuthatches, the white-breasted nuthatch, Tiffany, if you go to the next, the white-breasted nuthatch, and the brown-headed nuthatch, which are year-round birds for our area. And uh, let's see, and then there's some occasional winter visitors, lovely, lovely fox sparrow that occasionally we'll have coming to our bird feeder, or at least underneath the bird feeder in winter. Some seasons, uh, some winters, we see multiple purple finches. This past winter, we saw none at our feeders, and the same with pine siskin. You can see big flocks of these certain winters and, uh, and not other winters. And it depends on really on what their food source, source is in the north or whether they come this far south or not. And that really holds for the next two birds, the next slide, which are, are very rare, but we've had both of these on our property. The evening grosbeak, uh, which uh, really come to feeders and can wipe out a feeder, as you can see that's happening there of sunflower seeds. And this uh, really uh, lovely, crazy bird, the red crossbill, it's, not, it's called a crossbill for obvious reasons, and it uses that crossbill to open pine cones. And if, it's, if there's plenty of pine cones produced in Canada uh, in the summer, then this red crossbill will stay there through the winter. But if the pine cone crop is poor, like happens maybe one out of every dozen years or so, then these guys will come south spend their winter uh, around our area. So, um, so yeah, so, so if, if you haven't been a birder, where, where would you start? And, and I, I've arranged these sort of the progresses in sort of how you would, I think you should go about it. Uh, to be honest, I think the first thing to do is to get yourself a decent pair of binoculars. And, uh, uh, and you can do that for a, hundred dollars or less, I think. Uh, if you go to the uh, Audubon Society or Cornell Lab of Ornithology Society uh, website, they have some good advice on binoculars. Uh, you could contact me directly. I have some opinions on, on binoculars. And then what you do next is, uh, uh, well, I mean, put up bird feeders and start identifying the birds that are coming to your feeders, I mean, really identify them. Don't just look at them. Am I sure that's the bird I'm looking at, both male and female? 
but then really get out of doors and just focus on birding. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not taking, I'm taking a walk, but what I'm really doing is walking to see what, if I can identify what birds I see on this walk, uh, probably the best time to do it is between daybreak and 10 or 11 a.m. And that's particularly the case for, during, my, during migration where birds are most active and sing the most uh, uh, early in the morning. You know, you could start by identifying the 40 species or 50 species that are here year round. So if you, once you learn those, then you can figure out the birds that are coming to our areas. And while you're doing it, begin to learn the songs of those birds. Is there's nothing like seeing a bird sing a song to help you to remember that song belongs to that bird, if that makes sense. And then, uh, and then begin to learn uh, what birds come to our area to nest in our area. It's easiest to see, see these birds when they first arrive because they're singing a lot and there aren't so many leaves on the trees. It gets harder as the summer comes on. And then you can learn the songs of those birds. And then the really exciting part, uh, uh, as you add all this uh, knowledge, is, is to begin to learn the, the, the birds that migrate through our area and particularly the songs of those birds. So I've been doing this a long, long time, and I, I can safely identify the songs of most of the birds that we've talked about. But it's the bird that I hear that I don't know the song that tells me that, oh man, I need to try to see that bird and figure out what it is, because I, I, I don't know that song. That happened to me two or three times this spring where I spent 20 minutes, 30 minutes, trying to follow or following a bird, trying to see a bird that I could hear singing, that I knew it wasn't something I was sure about, but I could never see the bird. So I still don't know what it was, but it was exciting 20 to 30 minutes. I talked to myself, oh, you gotta see this bird. You gotta figure it out. Of course I didn't. And next spring though, I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure it out. So uh, as I said, one way to start identifying birds is to just, to, to put up feeders and identify uh, what's there, but that's only going to take you so far because uh, most species of birds don't come to bird feeders. So uh, yeah, so so what a bird if they don't come to feeders? What do they eat? And a good example is the Carolina chickadee, which spends a lot of time at our feeders in the winter time. In the winter, its diet includes seeds, berries, and what insects and caterpillars it can find. But once it makes, once these birds nest, and I watched a pair just outside our barn this spring, and watched what it was bringing to the, to the, uh, to the box, the bird box it was nesting in. They mainly bring caterpillars. Uh, there have been uh, studies done of breeding pairs of chickadees and shown that they, they need to bring about 7,500 caterpillars uh, to raise a clutch of young. So where are they gonna find these caterpillars? Uh, are they gonna find them there? No, this is a, I'm not sure where I got this. It may be from the book by Doug Tallamy, Bringing Nature Home, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll show that in a minute, but uh, this is a, 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 some wonderful habitat what used to be wonderful habitat that's been turned into an over-fertilized monoculture lawn that has no insects for birds. So you won't have birds out there because they can't find anything to eat. Uh, I think, yeah, so, and we've turned eight New Jersey's into these sort of uh, big expanses of lawns that have taken away habitat uh, for birds. And then the next slide, if, would, 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 a, would, a cat, would a chickadee find a caterpillar here? No. These are, uh, I think they're ca called calorie, calorie pears. A, a, a cultivar is a Bradford, a Bradford pear. These, these trees come from Asia. And so the, uh, the, uh, the moths and, uh, and butterflies that exist in North America did not evolve with these trees, so they don't use the, them as hosts. So a, so a chickadee is not gonna find uh, a caterpillar uh, or many caterpillars in these trees. It, it'd be much better off in an oak tree, well, it can find them in an oak tree or a hickory tree that is a host for 300, 400, 500 different species of moths and, and butterflies and their, therefore they're caterpillars. 
And the next slide, yeah, shows a photo of a man named Doug Tallamy. And I don't want to over advertise Doug Tallamy, but he, he's a scientist at the University of Delaware who studied birds and what they eat, basically, and a lot of other things. Uh, but uh, he's really been a voice for what we've done to this country of taking away uh, native species and planting species that don't, that don't have uh, food for birds in them. And so he's, he's really a great advocate for uh, turning your backyard into a, a habitat that, that, that's good for animals uh, of all kinds, but uh, we're talking about birds, so certainly good for birds. And this is a great book that he wrote, uh, Bringing Nature Home, and another book that he, where he uh, collaborated with a landscape architect to produce this book called The Living Landscape. But there are a lot of other sources for, uh, for, and the next slide shows what. Yeah, so yeah, so the idea is to plant native plants. If you have if you have opportunity to plant something in your yard, uh, choose a native plant over some uh, imported plant. And if you go to all kinds, there's there's a native plant society I know. If you go to the Audubon uh, Society website, they have all kinds of. Uh, or like the Audubon Society of North Carolina uh, or, or Virginia, uh, they have uh, good advice on what sort of plants to plant. And I, I think there's some shown there on the left. So uh, what are some sources that one can get information on birds? Uh, two great sources, uh, and I, I should acknowledge them first, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and the National Audubon Society. All the, all, all the photos of birds that I used in this presentation came from those two sites. They're wonderful sites that have multiple photos of birds in various of their plumages. And just great basic information on birds, where they nest, what they do, blah, blah, blah. And I've mentioned two of the authoritative voices uh, in our area, uh, the Virginia Society of Ornithology, and there are a lot of chapters of that group in Virginia and the Carolina Bird Club, and there's a number of uh, Audubon, uh, local Audubon chapters that are all uh, great sources for information. And then finally, uh, yes, yeah, so uh, thank you, and I'd love to answer any questions that's come up from anyone uh, during the presentation. Hi everyone, I'm back. Let's see if we have any questions. I don't see anything in the chat or Q&A box. Um, feel free to type your question in if you do. If not, Ken, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. You claim not to be an expert, but I think you have shown today that you have a lot of expertise on this. Oh, we just had something come in. Oh. Well, thank you, um, Kathleen, just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Um, and we are very, very appreciative for your volunteering your time today to share your passion on birds of the Dan River Basin. Thank you. All right, well, thank you everyone so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. It looks like the sun's coming out where I am here in Virginia. I don't know what it's like there in North Carolina, Ken, but. No sun. Ah, well, hopefully it'll be heading your way. <laughs> and uh, it looks like uh, Lee said, thanks, Ken, you have helped me identify birds. <laughs> so, so hopefully you've started a lot of people with um, a new passion and all of Ken's information and tags will be on the website when we post the recording and ken you said you wanted to also post your email address in yeah case it's fine to post my email and i'll uh try to answer i'll find if i don't know the answer i think i can find the answer then well right. thank you is. very very much for that all right everyone enjoy your day have a great day bye thank you mm -hmm.